So welcome to the March edition of the uh, CAFE seminar series. So today, uh, Svetlana Vrizgalova from London Business School will present her paper entitled Bayesian Solutions for the Fact the Zoo We Just Ran Two Quadrillion Models. And it's joined with Jan Tao Huang and Christian Julliard. Uh, the presentation uh, will be followed by discussion by Irina Zviadadze from HEC Paris. So thank you very much, Irina, for accepting to uh, discuss the paper. So Svetlana, the screen is all yours. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to present this paper. Uh, Christian Jullard, I think, is also uh, here, and it was the paper also co-authored with Chantal Huang, who is a very bright PhD student from uh, LSE. So, every year at the American Finance Association meeting, its current president takes a stage and delivers what is known as the presidential address, identifying important areas of research, encouraging further work. And on the graph here, you see the number of Google sites for each of these addresses of the last 10 years, updated as of March 8th. The one from 2011 clearly stands out. Would anybody try to venture a guess who delivered a presidential address in 2011? And what was the topic? Um, feel free to either speak up or maybe use the chat option. Yes, we have some messages in the chat from Alexandra and Matteo, and you're going to be absolutely correct. So this was the talk of John Cochrane, who presented his discount rates address and coined the term Factor Zoo. He was also followed by Cam Harvey in 2017, who talked about the dangers of bee hacking and the factor discovery. So together, they get about 1700 sites, which is obviously impressive compared with all the other topics. And it's kind of funny that Luigi Zingales' address on whether finance benefits the society overall managed to get less than 400 sites, which probably tells you something about the priorities in our profession. But linear factor models are, of course, used absolutely everywhere in finance, whether it is to design a trading strategy, to measure performance of the manager, identify systematic sources of risk in the economy. These factors can be based on stock characteristics or macro uh, data, and in the recent years, we saw an explosion of papers that try to revalidate existing approaches to dealing with these models. Why is there so much recent interest in this area? I would like to put forward two stylus facts. First, even estimating a very simple linear factor model can be a very challenging task. For example, it is notoriously difficult to build a confidence interval for cross-sectional measures of fit, such as R squared. Most of the models are misspecified anyway, and another big concern is identification. It is often quite easy to get an illusion of high level of fit, significant risk premium for some factors, while in reality this could be just a statistical artifact, similar to the classic weak instruments problem. Isolating these problematic factors and restoring inference in the models is not easy at all. And it often requires the use of very sophisticated, very specific techniques. The second problem we're facing today is, of course, the factor zoo. Over the last few years, the list of significant cross-sectional predictors has already been expanded to more than 400 variables, which means that we're dealing now with literally quadrillions of possible models that could include, you know, three, five, or maybe all 50 uh, factors. Literally, quadrillions of possible alternatives. And naturally, this of course leads to massive model uncertainty and the debate about what are the truly relevant predictors. And if you look at the current state of the literature, you notice that there are many different approaches to the estimation or kind of aggregation of this type of models. Yet, there is no general unified framework that could be used to extract information from quadrillions of possible models and furthermore actually test whether it is even possible to talk about selection of the factors or whether instead we should be thinking about aggregation of the information contained in all of these different variables. Whether those horse races that we have been seeing all over the literature even make sense. The method that would be applicable to both tradable and non-tradable factors. The method that would remain statistically valid even if the underlying models are misspecified and suffer from the lack of identification. 
And this is what we try to provide in this paper. We try to develop a Bayesian approach to the estimation of the linear factor models. And in this paper, I'm going to focus on the Fama Macbeth regressions, both in terms of the standalone model estimation and also what we can learn from this universe of potential models. But we're also uh, working hard on uh, the new version of the paper that is going to be extending all of these results to the SDF settings as well. And that is a fairly trivial extension, so there is nothing really that is limiting uh, the application to just Fama Macbeth regressions. For single model estimation, think of proposing a new three or four factor model, the method is going to be providing you a way to get estimates and confidence interval for risk premia or any other quantity of interest. Think of R square, sharp ratio, anything that you might be interested in, in literally a fraction of a second. The inference is going to be automatically robust to the spurious or weak factors, and it's going to be as fast as just running a simple OLS or the GLS regression. In terms of the general class of models, we're going to be using the tools related to the Bayesian model averaging. And we're going to show how one could think about model and factor selection and averaging in the space of linear factor models. Make sure that the results that you get are going to be robust to the misspecification identification. And they're also going to be reflecting this huge underlying model uncertainty that we uncover in the data. Finally, one of my personal sort of favorite features about this approach is that the type of priors, or think of them as tuning parameters that are going to be used throughout the analysis, they're all economically motivated. That is, if you tell me something, for example, about the average number of factors you expect to have in the model, or the sharp ratio that could be achievable in the economy, not as a point number, but let's say as a confidence interval. So, you know, fairly wide and reasonable numbers that all of us probably can agree on. You're actually going to be pinning down all of the D parameters for the procedure. So there is no ad hoc choice of, you know, some um, features in any way. So what do we find empirically? You know, what do we learn about the space of these models? First of all, there is massive model uncertainty and misspecification which is going to be immediately implying that our standard, you know, regression or GMM based approach is just not reliable. All of the models we have been estimating so far, they are profoundly misspecified. And we also show that they are misspecified in such a way so that the cross-sectional model space is essentially flat. That is, there are hundreds of equally best performing models that you would not be able to statistically differentiate from each other. This means that in principle, in this type of universe, it is impossible to design a reliable selection procedure like lasso or standard, you know, horse races for model comparison that people have been running in different papers. They're just not going to be reliable in this type of world. We also find out that none of the celebrated reduced form models, such as, you know, Fama French three or five factor version, um, they enter even top 1000 of the potential specifications. Yet, we do see that there are several robust factors that should probably definitely be part of the SDF if we were to write um, a data generating process out there. The best performing models in general, they include a lot of the different factors, tradable and non-tradable, and their sharp ratio overall is reasonable. What this tells us is that a lot of the factors that have been suggested in the literature, they're just repackaging or, you know, measuring from slightly different perspective the same underlying economic risks. And therefore, instead of thinking about factor selection or the model comparison, we should be thinking about how to aggregate the information contained in all of those models in the first place. Okay. So um, I'm going to start talking about the estimation of the standalone models first, and then we're going to move to factor selection, model selection, and what we actually learn if we try to run literally a gazillion of models or try to evaluate somehow the information contained in that set of factors. So first of all, let me start with a simple reminder of what is um, a linear factor model and how do we think about the CAPA. So in a standard linear factor model, the goal, of course, is to explain the cross-sectional spread and expected returns on a set of securities or portfolios by exposure to a given list of risk factors. And this naturally implies the following standard two-step procedure well familiar to all of you. 
And the first stage would regress asset returns on a set of factors, F, to measure their exposure betas. And in the second stage, we check whether expected returns on these portfolios actually line up with those betas. And if the slope in this cross-sectional regression is different from zero, we say that the factor is priced. The second stage can be estimated with OLS, GLS, or you can put it all together in a GMM system that doesn't really matter much. What matters is that the crucial requirement for the procedure to be valid is that the matrix of beetles should have full rank, or in other words, the risk premium should be identified in the first place. And this is actually what presents a major challenge for all of these classical approaches in kind of realistic data sets. As a Bayesian, you typically treat parameters as random variables. You try to learn about the risk premium and the betas from the data. And so one of the most widespread approach to get this joint distribution of the parameters is by using the so-called GIP sampler. Well, let's say if you are interested in you know, two variables, X and Y, you're basically thinking about their conditional distribution. And instead of estimating something, you're setting up a Markov chain that looks like a simulated you know, properties of the model. So X conditional on Y, Y conditional on X, and step by step, you are creating a chain that approximates the true joint distribution. So this is how Bayesian estimation intuitively works in practice. How would the same two-step regression look like in the Bayesian world? In the Bayesian world, you would typically start with a time series properties, then you move to betas, then you move to risk premium, and you're going to be repeating this cycle all over again. So if we start from the standard time series regressions that rely on diffuse priors, uh, we get the distribution of the betas and the residuals from the model. Conditional on those betas and the returns that we observe, the risk premia, the posterior distribution for the risk premia is going to become just a constant which is dependent on that particular draw of the betas. As a result, we can repeat this procedure many, many times and essentially reconstruct the joint distribution of risk premia and betas at the same time. Bayesian procedures are usually criticized for sort of being sensitive to the assumption of the priors. So the good thing here is that since we start, you know, with very flat kind of uninformative priors, they have no impact on the inference on the risk premium. And this is the type of the comparison you would normally see where uh, you have a well-identified model that you would normally estimate with your two-step regressions. And the blue line here stands for the standard frequentist estimation of the risk premium. And the red line is the one that is produced by, sorry, the other way around. The red line is the standard frequentist estimation of the risk premium associated with a factor. And the blue line is the one that corresponds to the Bayesian approach. And you see that they're almost identical. Okay, so prior has no impact on the estimate of the risk premium. The situation, however, is different when we're dealing with those complicated cases where the original model is not identified in the first place. And here's one such illustration where you see that the frequentist estimate of the formula Macbeth leads to a significantly negative risk premium associated with a factor, even though this factor by default is constructed in such a way so that it doesn't even correlate with the underlying set of test assets. So it should really be zero, but for some reason, because the procedure breaks down, you see that it is significant. In the Bayesian approach, since it's basically going to be looking like a simulation, right? You're going to be getting the draws of the betas that are centered around the true in sample estimates. So if I have two assets that have, for example, almost zero exposure to the underlying risk factor, so they're really kind of just noisy things out there, in one particular draw, it will turn out that the first asset is going to have a high beta relative to the other one. And so the risk premium could be, for example, negative. In another draw, however, it could turn out that it's the second asset will have a high beta relative to the first one. And so the sign of the risk premium associated with these draws is going to be switching. This is why, as you create more and more simulations like this, what you're going to see from the Bayesian procedure is that the posterior estimates of the risk premium for these you know, complicated factors is just going to be centered around zero. In other words, 
you basically get a solution to the identification problem for free in the Bayesian approach. You don't need to modify it in any way. It will not lead to any spurious significance levels of the risk premia or R squares, and it will not require any additional pretests that you would normally again try to implement with very special techniques that haven't been even coded for the majority of the packages yet. Obviously, as part of the Bayesian procedure, once you know the distribution for the risk premium of the betas, you also get results for everything else in the model. You get confidence intervals for R squared automatically. You get confidence intervals for, let's say, Hansen Jagannath and distance or sharp ratio or whatever it is that you might be interested in. The method works well for small and large samples, and it could be used in many different settings. It is very fast and easy to use. Here is a simple illustration of how confidence intervals with the R square could look like if I were to use a Bayesian approach. And again, if your model is weakly identified in the first place, standard procedures are going to be breaking down. So the Llewellyn and Shankin, for example, confidence intervals are going to be showing you the wrong values. And the blue area indicates what you would actually get from the Bayesian approach, which restores the right inference. Here are some of the examples of the models and how the estimation could look like. Let's say for liquidity adjusted CAPM, which is at the top of the table, you see that the risk premium for the liquidity factor ceases to become significant once you move to the Bayesian approach. And again, you get confidence intervals for everything that you might be interested in, in a fraction of a second. So here's how you would try to estimate standalone models. But of course, we're also interested in model selection factor selection, and comparison of different specifications. How model inference is working in the Bayesian world? In the Bayesian world, everything starts with the Bayes law, right? So if you are thinking about comparing the probability of model one or model two being the truth generating the data, they are going to be proportional to how well that data is actually described by a given model. And that proportionality is going to be reflecting not only, say, the risk premium, but the structure of the model in general. And this is what is known as the marginal likelihood, sometimes also called the integrated likelihood. So that is for all the possible ranges of the underlying model parameters, we need to figure out what is its overall fit, given the data. And it turns out that if I were to do an analysis like this, with these marginal likelihoods, uh, in order to compare different asset pricing models against each other, one cannot rely on completely flat priors. And the problem that arises there is actually quite similar to the problem that breaks down frequentist inference in the traditional asset pricing models, which are going to be weakly identified as well. And as there exist solutions for the frequentist problem, we apply a similar one to the Bayesian world. And we show how to restore the model comparison in this way by using the spike and slab prior. The intuition behind this is very simple. For those factors which do not have enough variation in the betas to strongly identify the risk premium associated with them, and as a result, you know, integrate the overall fit of the model across all of the parameter range, we assign a prior that shrinks it a little bit towards zero. So that shrinkage is going to be dependent on directly, let's say, the partial correlations between the factors and the test assets. Since we are estimating the model in standardized variables, we show that this prior directly maps into the prior for the sharp ratio of a given risk factor. And there is a reasonable range of parameters that are going to be motivated by economic observations. Uh, well, I'm going to be showing you estimation for a wide range of priors to show you how that is going to be affecting your potential decision. The one that I would really like you guys to keep in mind is the psi in the area of 10 or 20 that basically corresponds to the assumption that sharp ratios as large as something like 0.9 to 2.6 are within 95% confidence interval. So this is the area of the kind of annual sharp ratios that we typically think about reasonable. We can also, in a similar way, deal with the level factors as well. And it turns out that this restores all the procedures of this valid model comparison in the Bayesian world. We get all the necessary objects uh, that are used for the model comparison and factor selection in closed form and can easily estimate millions of models literally one by one. That said, 
if we really want to learn something about the overall space of models, as I said in the introduction, we have to think about quadrillions. Because we could be thinking about three-factor models, five-factor models, or maybe even 20-factor models. And obviously, dealing with quadrillions, we cannot just, you know, estimate them one by one. It would probably take another hundred of years in order for us to actually see the overall output. So what we do instead, we learn how to sample them. And this is important because when we try to learn something about the overall set of models, we're also going to be able to um, say a lot of things about features of this overall model space such as the sharp ratios or the risk premium associated with a given factor, not just within that particular equation, that particular combination of three variables, but across all the possible specifications that those factors can be included in. And furthermore, our procedure is going to be designed in such a way so that we're going to be learning about the feature of the data from precisely the models that are most informative about those underlying features. And this is what is known as the continuous spike and slab approach, where instead of saying that a factor is a part of the model or not a part of the model, you're trying to estimate the probability that is going to be part of the model. And therefore, jointly, you're going to be estimating, you know, what is the chance that the factor is a part of the SDF? What is the risk premium that are going to be associated with this factor? And what are the aggregate features of the model? This leads to very large efficiency gains and allows us to literally deal with these uh, quadrillions of possible models. And furthermore, we show that in order to run the whole procedure, which takes maybe like a couple of hours or something like this, so it's really, really efficient and fast, you actually need to supply the beliefs only about three objects, which are probably the most intuitive for many of us working in empirical asset pricing. And in fact, the beliefs about the sharp ratio achievable with one factor. And again, not just, you know, a point number, but like a confidence interval around them fairly wide. The sharp ratio roughly achievable in the economy overall. And the sparsity pattern or the average numbers of the factors that you would expect the model to have. All of those very three simple um, objects are going to be fully determining specifications for the priors. Okay. So let's see what we learn empirically from the data and what we have found after running all of these models. The results that I'm going to be showing you today are going to be largely based on the cross-section of 25 farmer French size and book-to-market portfolios and also 30 industry portfolios. This has been probably the most popular cross-section used in the uh, many papers over the years. That said, in the paper we also try to uh, make a lot of efforts on the robustness sort of side of things and we estimate the whole model I think on 24 other types of cross-sections and also on various anomaly sorted portfolios so the new draft is going to be containing a new set of test assets as well and all of the qualitative results that I'm going to be talking to you about they're all exactly the same across all of these test assets so we're reasonably certain that the most important part of the messages from the paper, they are absolutely robust to the choice of the test assets. We're going to consider a set of 51 factors that relate to both tradable and non-tradable variables, which is going to be leading to a little bit more than two quadrillions of possible models, because we're going to be looking at all the possible combination of those factors together. So if you are a fan of regressions, like, you know, we all are, if you were to try to learn something about the whole space of models by literally estimated one by one with regressions, you would have to wait a very long time because you would have to run 126 quadrillions of regressions. And if you're a fan of, you know, astronomy, this is equivalent to something like 25,000 galaxies in terms of the average number of stars contained in each of the galaxies. As um, extensions of um, these empirical results, if the time permits, I'm going to mention some of the out of sample robustness that we also do and other tests related to the cross sectional uncertainty. And as I mentioned uh, some time ago, I'm also going to be showing you results for different levels of shrinkage so you can also see how different beliefs about the sharp ratios, for example, of the given risk factors could affect your findings. And the first thing I want to start with is this graph. 
this graph shows you the posterior um, um, model probabilities for the best performing 1000 models. And there are two things that I want you to notice here. First is that even the best of the model has the chance of being the true one only equal to 0.01%. And it is somewhat tempting to say that, well, what did you expect? You know, you started with quadrillions of models. It's just impossible maybe to learn anything about it. No, there is actually a lot of the information reflected in this number. And the way to understand it is to think that precisely coming from quadrillions of models, so the prior of, you know, one over quadrillion of possible specifications, to reach an improvement to 0.01%, you would have to learn a tremendous amount from the data. So the data is very informative about the cross-section. What this picture shows you, however, is that the best performing models, they form a flat surface. And in fact, if you were to do something like a standard likelihood ratio test of the first, you know, three or four hundred of models, you would not be able to distinguish them at all from each other. There are many different specifications that give you exactly the same level of fit. And here I'm showing you the 10 most likely models where the bottom row in the table shows you exactly the probability of the data being generated by each of those models. And you see that all of these top 10 models, they include largely the same type of variables that are repeating more often than others. These are HML, MarketStar, and SMB. These are the three factors that seem to be really be picked up by a lot of the very successful models. And for those of you who don't know, MarketStar and SMB Star, these are improved version of the traditional market and, and size factor that are coming from a recent paper by Ken Daniel and his co-authors. That said, the majority of the models that are in top 10 or even, you know, top 100, they're fairly dense. So the check mark here is indicating the inclusion of the corresponding risk factor in each of those models. And you see that you know, things related to, let's say, profitability or quality minus junk or like uh, skewness or industrial production growth, they're being picked up by all of these different models. So this is something that we're also going to see uh, fairly soon when I show you results on the model dimension. But what this tells me is that the model space is dense in the underlying factors. And these are the posterior probabilities of the factor inclusion. That is, if I start with a prior of 50%, whether a factor should be part of the model or not, what does the data tell me about the probability of the model really including that factor? There are three types of variables which are actually displayed in this picture. The first type is the group of HML, MarketStar and SMB that you have already seen from the previous slide. And you see these are the three factors for which we have the posterior being sort of consistently higher than the prior. That's where the data is reasonably certain that, you know, those three variables should probably be really part of the model. There is a group of factors where the prior and the posterior are incredibly close to each other, regardless of that level of shrinkage, of that level of beliefs about the underlying sharp ratios. So the data is not informative about them at all. And then there is a group of factors for which you see that the posterior really goes below the original prior. This is where those factors are just really rejected. So there is a very uh, well smaller probability that they should be really part of the model relative to our initial assumption. The interesting thing is that not only those three variables are kind of robust factors that are supported by the data, but also the risk premium associated with them seems to be a fairly robust feature of the data as well. In other words, these are the only three factors that more or less seem to be pricing themselves. And regardless of what are the type of models that they are actually going to be included in, you know, from all of these different specifications, when aggregated across all of these different models, you do see that they have kind of a significant risk premium attached to them. Okay. Now, you might be worried that if you design a sampling scheme with, you know, quadrillions of models, there's a good chance that you may be missing something important. Or what if I have a strong belief that the true model out there shouldn't include too many factors? I mean, dealing with 20 variables or 50 seems to be somewhat excessive in the majority of our applications. So here is an example of the analysis of the models that includes 
only those that include no more than five factors. That is one, two, three, four, five. Okay? So we have up to five models that gives you about 2.6 million of potential specifications. We estimate all of them and we aggregate results across all of them. And what you see is that the output of this procedure is almost exactly the same as if uh, we were to analyze the whole quadrillion space in the first uh, in the first place. So the results are very robust to various assumptions about the underlying uh, model structure and the dimensionality of the factors. Now, we have found that there is a lot of the uncertainty about the true model and that the selection of the right specification probably is not even feasible in this space. But there is one thing that we do know for sure is that those models that we have been using so far in many papers, they are definitely far from the truth. In fact, none of the, you know, celebrated models that include, you know, one, two, three, or like five different factors, even the one that includes our robust set of variables, you know, HML, market star, and SMB star, is not even entering top 1000. So all of this time, we basically have been, you know, comparing different versions of the models and we're fighting over misspecified uh, models in the, in the first place. And while I don't really want you to take away um, uh, from this paper as to consider that, you know, here's a new set of three factor models that should be applied. No, that's not the message at all. But this table shows you kind of a little bit of a cheeky exercise. What if you were to pit the robust factor model, the collection of those three variables against our celebrated specifications? It would beat all of them quite easily. Now, I mentioned to you that the dimensionality of those models that we recover is fairly dense. And this is what you see on the graph on the left, where the average number of factors is fairly large for all of these successful specifications. And it is often in the dimension of, let's say, like 20 or 25, again, depending on some of the underlying assumptions you have in the sharp ratios. That said, the sharp ratios that we get out of the estimation is actually very reasonable. And the thing that really allows us to model and get these results is the fact that there is quite a lot of common information contained in those original factors. So economically, the type of risks of those variables are representing are very similar to each other. And the other thing that also allows us to get these very stable and realistic results is the fact that the type of priors that imposed on the sharp ratios a number of factors that basically act as shrinkage. That is, there is no overfitting, which is uh, going to be done by the model. But instead of using some ad hoc procedures to find, you know, the best possible combination of the factors, this is the procedure that relies directly on the economic intuition, on what we can reasonably believe to be a plausible assumption about financial markets. Now, I mentioned to you that these were results um, achieved in the setting of the thermal Macbeth regressions, but easily you can modify the procedure to do with the SDF specification uh, from the very beginning. And we find that a lot of the results stay exactly the same. The same you know, model space is going to be absolutely flat if you were to estimate it within a part of the SDF. The types of the groups of factors that uh, should be probably excluded from the model or unlikely to be part of the model and relatively few robust variables that should probably be definitely part of the model, they also stay exactly the same. So let me briefly talk a little bit about some of the other robustness checks that we have done to make sure that our procedure is valid and the results are really kind of general, represent the general message uh, for the profession. We've done an auto-sample exercise by splitting the sample into different time periods and seeing how the estimated, you know, SDF, the pricing model, is going to be working out of sample. And it really works quite well. So the model that aggregates information from all of those quadrillions of models actually able to capture about 85% of the total sharp ratio, which is achievable on the market across all of these different strategies, which I think is a really good benchmark. And the key that is behind the good performance of the model is exactly that economically motivated shrinkage that we have been suggested, suggesting. And this is what you see at the graphs where you see that, for example, the root mean, mean squared error is being low precisely at the areas that correspond to, you know, psi being around like 10 or 20, which is, you know, the reasonable range for the sharp ratios that I was drawing your attention in the first place. 
we could try to estimate this procedure, this SDF, from, let's say, a set of anomalies or just tradable risk factors, and then try to see how that works on the test assets that have not been used in the estimation of the model in the first place. That is sort of cross-sectionally an out-of-sample exercise. And here are the results for these two types of cross-sections, in particular the one on the right includes 49 industry portfolios, which are notoriously hard to price. And the model is doing a really good job at pricing there. Okay. Finally, we have also done quite a lot of the robustness checks to make sure that our results are robust in any possible way with regards to the choice of the original set of test assets. And while in general there is not kind of a well-established, agreed-upon way on how to eliminate this dependency from the test assets, we decided to use the revealed preference approach. That is, we literally went down to all the papers that have been published in the recent years, presented at conferences, or have been just published on SSRN website that would deal with a factor of estimation, and we manually collected what are the type of test assets that have been used in all of these different papers. This allowed us to probably focus on the most important, at least from the profession perspective, type of the cross-sections. And by aggregating them together and using those empirical weights, we were able to create 25 different cross-sections that represent the sort of profession viewpoint on what should be the right test assets. We've repeated the analysis on all of them, aggregated analysis across all of them. We got exactly the same results. So uh, finally, let me mention some of the extensions that could be really done with this paper and why we believe that the Bayesian way of estimation as a pricing model is such an interesting, probably promising avenue. So first of all, as I already said, it's trivial to move the whole thing into the SDF or, for example, impose various restrictions on the risk premium of tradable factors. We can allow for models with time varying betas and risk premium. We can deal with latent factors and generated factors. So, for example, if you want to use mimicking portfolios or latent factors such as principal components, the procedure is going to be very easy to extend to this setting as well. And furthermore, it's going to explicitly account for the estimation uncertainty related to the construction of those principal components or mimicking factors in the first place, something that, again, usually is really hard to achieve in the frequentist domain. But most importantly, as I said at the very beginning, this is really a setting that allows you to unify the answers to so many questions that so far have been all quite fragmented, that have been all achieved with different techniques and sometimes very specific techniques that are impossible to extend to other settings and therefore making it really difficult to understand what do we learn overall about the space of factor models and the sources of risk and the economy. For people interested in just estimating simple asset pricing models, it is a very easy tool to use, where within a second you literally get you know, confidence intervals for everything and you know that your inference is going to be robust to identification without doing any pretests or modifying any of the procedures. At the same time, this is also a setting that tells you something about how to make sure your inference is robust to misspecification by aggregating across all of these models. We can learn something about the model space overall, about the dimension of the factors and about whether the selection in this type of universe is even feasible or not. And as the data indicates, probably not. This is what we found empirically, that there is massive model uncertainty, that there is nothing, none of the traditional three or five factor models are going to be entering even top thousand of the potential specifications. And it seems like what we are really dealing with is a lot of the repackaging of the same underlying economic risks. And therefore, in these type of settings, averaging, aggregating across potential model space should probably be the right way to go. And that is going to be the a main tool behind reliable inference going forward in finance, both in and out of sample. I think I should be right on time. Uh, and I very much look forward to the uh, comments from Irina. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. It was a very exciting and timely presentation. So indeed, uh, Irina Zviadadze is going to give the discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much to Laran, Araman and Kim for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper. 
Bayesian solutions for the factor zoo, we just ran two quadrillion models by Svetlana, Jantal, and Christian. I'll start with very quick overview. So what this paper offers us is a Bayesian way to think about Fama Macbeth regressions, a standard methodology when we estimate and evaluate cross-sectional factor-based asset, linear asset price and models. Uh, Raman knows I'm a huge fan of Bayesian uh, estimations, and I think it's very cool that we can, um, as a byproduct of estimation procedure, uh, think immediately about inference and model selection is particularly easy. And so I'm all in favor of go, going Bayesian. But this paper is not only about generalizing what we did in frequentist way, by to Bayesian way, but this is a methodology with a specific emphasis on detecting spurious factors and making sure that inference is robust to the presence of spurious factors. And why the authors are so much interested in this? Well, because they relate factor zoo, factors proliferation to spurious inference. And they think that we have this factor zoo mostly because we um, use in our models factors which are spurious. So the way to go around this problem is to go Bayesian and use some uh, clever priors. And it's a very elegant solution, um, which is going to be delivered thanks to the use of so-called spike and slap prior. So what the authors are going to do in this paper is going to be mostly a methodological paper with also a big empirical uh, section. And uh, there, the authors are going to provide many different ways to think about how we can apply this method. And more specifically, they will be providing estimates of risk premia for various factors, both tradable and non-tradable. And they will try to make progress on understanding the factors zoo. And here, uh, the solution seems to be limited because there will be so many models that will show very similar performance in the cross section. At least that's my reading of the results. So my uh, discussion is going to be uh, structured in the following way. Svetlana is an excellent communicator. I will have to revisit the problem and solution just a little bit um, without um, repeating too much, but I need to start with this because I will have to connect some of, your th my th or some of these ingredients to my comments. I will be thinking uh, then about challenges this method is facing, uh, thinking about what spurious factors are and what are the empirical takeaways. So let's start uh, with the classic two pass regressions and cross-sectional asset pricing. So the first one, and I will be uh, using similar notation to the author's one, but with some abuse of notation. So I'm going to basically skip a few things that I don't really need. And so we start with the first pass. It's a regression of excess returns on factors F. We get estimates of uh, risk exposures better, and then we run cross-sectional regression. Mean returns on estimated factor exposures, and then we get lambdas. So lambdas are estimated well if we, if we can have the matrix better transposed better be in full rank. If it's impossible to invert this matrix, then uh, as you see, it's, a very it's a very problematic to think about what is lambda. So what are the cases when the matrix is not full rank? So one case is when the factor F is a useless factor. It, what, what, what is the definition of this useless factor? Well, it's a factor which is not correlated with test assets, returns on test assets. This paper takes less extreme approach and they think not about useless factors, but so-called spurious factors defined this way mathematically. So think about um, exposures that are going to approach zero as T grows with a specific rate of convergence. But uh, this, the problem of useless factors is not the only problem that will cause um, non-invertibility of this matrix. Another problem that one can face is um, presence of multicollinearity. So think about factors uh, such that um, uh, risk exposures of different assets to these factors have multicollinearity. So let's start with useless factors problem. And this problem is not very new. Um, and it's known at least since Khan and Zhang and various solutions have been proposed to these problems in different settings with different corrections. And Svetlana also contributed to this problem a few years ago. But um, uh, there was a few, uh, also a simple recipe given by Khan and Zhang when they uh, emphasized the problem about uh, useless factors in, in the setting of the cross-sectional regressions. 
So the recipe they gave to the profession is when you run the first pass, be very careful and test whether the betas are actually jointly significantly different from zero. And so if there is a useless factor, you see that all betas are insignificant, just don't take this factor to the second stage. And that approach was uh, taken by a few authors in different papers, but apparently not everyone in the profession. And so what this paper does, at least my understanding, is that it's going to translate this idea in this first bullet point to a Bayesian, uh, to a Bayesian approach. So they're going to encode this idea to a Bayesian estimation procedure in a very clever way so that you don't need to stop your procedure at some point, test something, and then proceed. Everything is going to be done uh, uh, automatically, but they are going to rely exactly on this bullet point, on this property of joint significance of factors, basically on the joint significance of covariances between factors and test assets. So let me move to Bayesian solutions to the um, two-pass procedure. Uh, so how we can think about implementing the same two-pass uh, two regressions, Fama Macbeth regressions in Bayesian, uh, in Bayesian way. So I'm going to skip completely the first pass. I'm going to just uh, focus on the second pass because the second pass is a problematic one when we have useless factors. So this is the second uh, pass regression. So what the authors are going to be doing, they're going to be imposing priors as always done in the Bayesian um, econometrics. And they're going to be thinking about uninformative priors. So no information is really um, given to the procedure to uh, tilt likelihood one way or another. And so what we are going to get, if we do so, the posterior distribution of the parameter of risk premium is going to be normal with this uh, mean and uh, variance. And if you compare the OLS solution to the mean, you see it's exactly the same expression. And this is a very well-known result in Bayesian econometrics. And this is related to the fact that we use an informative priors. So same solution is going to give the same problem when we want to understand which factors, which models we have to take um, to the reality. So the solution is going to be now uh, formulated with that insight from Kahn and Zhang that I mentioned beforehand. And so this is going to be implemented in the following way. So the authors are going to be trying to uh, incorporate this uh, notion of how uh, factors co-vary with asset returns. And so they are going to reformulate the prior for the parameters of risk premium. So I'm going to again skip many details. Let's just think about the prior for the parameters of risk premium. And now you see here subscript gamma, which indicates a specific model gamma, and the model is going to correspond to a specific set of factors. Here it's going to be K capital factors. And the prior is going to be normal, centered at zero. So there is no, um, um, there is no ex ante bias towards either positive or negative risk premium. And what is going to be important here, how we are going to define the variance of the prior. So it's going to depend on this matrix, matrix D gamma, which is going to be key. So D gamma is going to be diagonal matrix. Diagonal elements are going to encode information about the correlation of a specific factor with asset returns. So let's look at this representation. Psi J, which are going to be inverse of these elements on the diagonal are going to be uh, depending, uh, are going to depend on the squared correlation between um, factor J and asset returns. So think about a strong factor. A strong factor is a factor for which correlations are high. So Psi J is going to be high number, relatively speaking. So D gamma is going to have small elements on the diagonal. Think about very weak factor. Rho is going to be very close to zero, say even zero. So psi j's are going, psi j is going to be very small or zero. And so in diagonal, we have a very big number or infinity in extreme case. So now if you look at how posterior is going to look, uh, posterior is going to depend on the following lambda gamma head. So this is the mean of the posterior. And so the formula stays exactly the same as under flat priors uh, that I've shown to you on the previous slide. With one, with one change is that here we are going to have this matrix D gamma, which is going to encode in uh, how uh, strong factors are in the specific cross section. So again, let me uh, uh, remind you. So if rows are very small, psi is very small, uh, this element is going to be very large. So 
I'm sorry. So we are going to have lambda gamma here, which is going to depend on, on this matrix with very, very large elements on the diagonal. So when you invert, you're going to get zero. So you're going to push risk premium for a specific factor to zero, and it's going to be very tightly estimated at zero. On the other hand, the factor is strong. D gamma is almost absent in this formulation because this first component is going to dominate. And therefore, the estimation for strong factors is going to be very similar to frequentist approach or to approach with flat tires. So that's basically how this uh, problem is going to be uh, addressed in the estimation. So then uh, starting from that, from that, everything will work very easily and naturally and very nicely. Thank you very much, Laura. So now I would like to talk about challenges which, which this method is still going to face. Um, and this challenge is going to relate to the other problem, um, to the other cause of the invertibility of the matrix uh, that delivers you the estimate of uh, risk premium. This is going to be related to the presence of level factors or factors with collinear exposures. And it's going to be impossible to establish importance of such factors without actually an input from an economic model. So let me talk about level factors and slope factors very briefly in turn. So why level factors is a problem? Well, level factors is a problem because the authors formulate cross-sectional step in the following way by including intercept. And so because they include intercept, they cannot have a factor in their model such that assets are going to load on the factor in a very similar way, because then it would create collinearity in the second step. And um, uh, they um, 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 deal with this problem by ruling out level factors thanks to specific, specific, a specific formulation of this matrix D gamma, which was key to get rid of this spurious factor problems. But uh, essentially what they will achieve is that they are not going to be able to establish importance of level factors. And here I politely disagree with uh, such a strategy because it's not clear that we should care less about level uh, of risk premium rather than about the slope, even though the cross-sectional asset pricing is uh, almost predominantly focused on the slope of the cross-section and explaining the slope. On top of everything, this will likely lead to uh, missing macroeconomic factors, which is much more important, I think, um, debate in the literature, what is the relationship between macroeconomic factors and asset prices, rather than what is the relationship between asset returns and, fact and uh, return-based uh, factors. So here I brought a slide where uh, what I do is very, very, very simple. I take 25 size and book to market portfolios. I evaluate from a French three-factor model. The first step, uh, you see the betters uh, being estimated. Um, I don't put any way standard, uh, standard errors, uh, very sloppy, but it's enough to make my point. Um, so if you will look at the exposures of assets to markets, you see that it's almost flat line. And so uh, this is the level factor. Uh, if you think about, uh, 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 how better betters are lining up. And so when we uh, look at the second pass regression and we run it with an intercept, let's look at how uh, uh, prices of risk are estimated and how they're related to average, um, average uh, uh, returns on the factors. We see the usual problem or the very well-known problem is that the, market pri the price of the market factor is estimated being negative, whereas it's approximately 0 0.5. Let me fix very quickly this problem by just removing intercept, removing, removing this multicollinearity problem. And you see that prices of risk are going to line up very nicely with the average returns on the factors. So level factors are something that we need to think about, I, I would think. Another, uh, Another potential uh, cause of multicollinearity is when we have factors which are orthogonal, not necessarily, but they could be orthogonal, but asset returns are going to line up to these factors in a multicollinear way. So this is the example uh, which, is, uh, which I took from my job market paper. Um, in, in my job market paper, I was estimating different sources of macroeconomic risk and how 
uh, they relate uh, or how currency returns are relate are re, uh, relate to, the, to this uh, sources of risk and what i find is that there are two shocks which are orthogonal one is inflation and one is an interest rate shock and high yield currencies higher yield currencies are going to have significantly higher exposure to both of the shocks over multiple horizons meaning that if i were to bring uh, exposures um which I estimate in a different way to the second pass regression and try to establish what is the risk premium associated with these two sources of risk. I will face multicollinearity problem and there will be no statistical way to resolve this problem unless I bring some insight from economics, meaning that I need to bring identification assumption from economics. For example, like if I want to know what is the price of one of the sources of risk, I would, I would bring that information to the second pass regression and I would be able to resolve multicollinearity problem by only estimating price of another source of risk. So I think these are kind of questions which, which we still need to think about, but let me uh, make one qualification. This is not um, um, only about, this is not the challenge that uh, this methodology faces because it is in a Bayesian way reformulated. It's in general the problem that any two-pass uh, regression methodology is going to face whether it's implemented in the frequentist way or in Bayesian way. Now let me think about what is a spurious factor. So um, spurious factor is um, going to be defined in this paper as uh, something uh, to which assets have very small exposures. And here what I'm thinking about is that very small exposure it's a relative notion. There, there has to be a benchmark relative to what we are going to measure this small exposure. And now I'm going to show you with two examples why it's problematic just purely on statistical basis de decide what is a very small exposure. And actually I'm going to build on another paper by Svetlana and Christian. So they have another paper which was uh, just updated a uh, very interesting paper that builds on the idea of Parker and Juilliard. And um, in this paper, they, uh, the authors identify an innovation that is priced in the cross-section of stock and bonds and explain 26% of consumption variation. So this is the picture from the paper and the key idea of the paper. What the authors do, they're going to model jointly consumption growth across different horizons and asset returns. And they're going to be thinking that both are going to expose to common source of risk, FT, which is going to be white noise shock, with one difference that consumption growth is going to respond to that shock across different horizons. Think about impulse response. Uh, and returns are going to have just one off effect. The, the shock is going to have one off effect. So if you compute this multi-period period covariance, you also see how it looks here. It's going to have this representation where rho r is going to be the vector of exposures of returns to consumption, factor Ft, the shock. And rho j is going to, uh, so the sum of rho j is going to accumulate of a response of consumption to this shock Ft. So if we look at the contemporaneous exposure, it's significant and very small, and the exposure is going to grow as the horizon grows. So what the authors document is that uh, this covariance is going to be priced in the cross sections of stock and bonds, and very much so. But if this covariance is priced and FT is white noise, what it suggests is that consumption growth cannot be a spurious factor, just because if we very carefully look at this multi-period covariance and think about also contemporaneous covariance, they have a common component, which is rho r, these exposures. If these exposures are not statistically significant different from each other, they're not going to be different, no matter how, um, how many periods you're going to take here when you compute the covariance, because it's going to be only scaled up by this sum. So there has to be significance at any horizon. Another example that I'm going to bring that is going to show the importance of consumption risk is a very recent paper by Mike Chernov, Lars Lockster, and Magnus Dahlquist. Uh, this paper constructs a conditional projection of the SDF that prices currencies unconditionally and conditionally. And I would suggest everyone to read this paper, not only those who are interested in pricing of currency risk, because it makes a very interesting point. 
um, when we uh, when we construct SDF that actually prices correctly, an admissible SDF that prices correctly uh, underlying assets and strategies, what we can find is very different from what we find in the cross-sectional regressions. So, for example, the authors show that um, those factors which appear to be significant in uh, two past regressions, like equity realized volatility and foreign exchange realized volatility, are actually not related at all to price risk in currency space. And without um, using any information on consumption growth, the authors also show that consumption growth is actually related to price risk. And so this is, these two papers, uh, um, Christian's and Svetlana's, and this paper by Chernov, Dalquist, and Logster show that consumption growth is a price risk, or at least it's related to price risk in both currency space and equity space, whereas literature that is settles on spurious factors shows that consumption growth is a spurious factor. And one example is today's paper, another example is Svetlana's paper, which was a hijab market paper. So why there are these conflicts and messages? Well, uh, my interpretation is because regression-based evidence is not enough. So one solution to go would be through the lens of admissible SDF. Um, and admissible is a key word here. So I know that Svetlana and Christian with Jantao are working um, uh, on that extension of their paper. I haven't seen any results uh, yet though. And um, we have also ongoing work with Raman Paolo and Massimo Dello Preta, in which we show that um, if you have an admissible SDF, you can, uh, you, you can approach uh, the factor zoo problem. And that approach will be robust to orthogonal factors with Kalini exposures as well as level factors. So it looks like a natural way to go. <clears throat> and let me very quickly mention um, uh, maybe this last point is that um, this paper takes uh, a view that spurious factors cause factor proliferation. My view on uh, this problem was a little bit different. I think about more like abundant repackaging of asset returns into factors. And I think uh, if we want to really um, underline what is the problem of factor proliferation and uh, put more weight towards spurious factors, my proposal would be to start and look at the big cross-section of assets rather than trying to look at different cross-section and average results across different cross-sections because some of the assets become overrepresented in these cross-sections. And this, the method of this paper looks like being perfectly designable to start with a big cross-section. So I have few, um, a few comments that I will skip uh, in the interest of time and I'm going to share my slides with uh, the authors and happy to have uh, discussions afterwards, let me conclude by saying that um, this is a very interesting paper that presents an elegant method for factor models um, to understand and uh, select models. It's the method which is robust to the presence of spurious factors. There are caveats. Uh, we still don't know how to uh, establish importance of level factors, so factors with collinear risk exposures, and I would suggest to think very carefully about macro factors with so-called small exposures of assets towards them, because at the end of the day, we don't want just uh, understand uh, um, uh, dynamics of asset returns by uh, factors which are repackaged asset returns. And my last suggestion would be given that there is so much of empirics in the paper to try and to put front and center the novel findings that changes our view on the factor zoo and that suggest new research, research avenues. Thank you very much. I'm sorry if I took extra time. Well, thank you, Irina. That was a very thoughtful discussion. Uh, Zetlana, would you like to respond briefly? Sure. Um, thank you so much. So, Irina, really, thanks a lot. You know, lots of comments, uh, lots of great things to think about. And actually, a lot of the issues that you have highlighted is exactly what we've been pondering ourselves when working on the revision. So I'm glad that we agree on so many things. Um, maybe I wanted to uh, comment on a couple of things. So the first is related to the level factors. So I totally agree that a lot of the especially macro variables, it seems like they're really going to be related to the level effect and misspecification of the level of your think about, you know, risk free sort of, you know, pricing sense is almost as important as misspecification of the slope. Um, there is no question about this. Um, that said, um, we don't have to eliminate necessarily the level factors if we don't want to. 
So we can, you know, specify that matrix D in such a way so that level factors are not being shrunk or eliminated away. And in fact, we have already done these results in both Pharma Macbeth and the SDF representation. And so the findings with relates to the factors, they stay exactly the same. One of the reasons why I think there was such a big difference of imposing essentially that kind of level restriction in the regression that you showed is because those standalone models, they are heavily misspecified. So let's say the risk premium on the market, it also is going to become, you know, significant, not only if you, uh, you know, impose a zero intercept in the model, but for example, if you were to reconstruct those missing factors from Zhigliong Xiu approach and many others. So uh, that's why I think there is kind of like side effect here. And I totally agree about the role of consumption, precisely because I'm, you know, I'm a strong proponent of the uh, kind of structural models there. And there is definitely, you know, parts within the consumption that are informative about the test assets, which is why when I say something spurious or something weak, the right interpretation, you know, from the Bayesian sort of perspective would be to say that cross-section is just not informative about the risk premium that could be identified using the test assets. So it's not going to be eliminated from the model. It's just that the posterior is going to be the same as the prior, which is the right interpretation. Data is not informative about it. If it's possible to design um, such a test in which there is going to be a, you know, identification of that, you know, latent shock, for example, and use that one as part of the model, or to modify the procedure in general for a completely different setting, then it could be very well identified. So I don't want, you know, weak factors or level factors or anything like this to be kind of perceived as something that's absolutely useless or should not be part of the model. No, um, identification is, is as much test for test assets as it is a feature of the factors themselves. So that's why I don't think that there is any disagreement uh, kind of in the findings of those things and um, how to make sure that we have all these different papers, again, sort of consistent with each other. I think that's exactly kind of what we are here for because that's what research is all about, right? Yeah, but once again, thank you so much for the comments uh, and uh, please, you know, share the slides. I will look forward to talking more about this. Thank you. Thank you both. So we have a, a number of questions. Uh, Benjamin uh, Hogwart has been, has been waiting for a long time now. Benjamin? Hi. hi. Uh, thanks, uh, Laurent. So, so just, just to make sure I have this it's more clarification question to understand the picture. So what people usually, when they talk about identification problem in this uh, cross-section, they, they think about like the parameters. And I have the impression that your paper is showing that more generally, there is an identification problem about the model in the sense that many models give you kind of a similar kind of result. And if it is the case, so can I, is it kind of a confirmation of, can we see your paper as a confirmation of this uh, old paper by Raisman, who was saying that if you have an approximate factor structure and you can find k variable that kind of span uh, the cross section, then you can probably find over k variable that do a similar job. It's changing the base. Is it how I should understand it or? Yes, um, absolutely. So there is a lack of identification here uh, on kind of double dimension. One is that there doesn't seem to exist a single model that is really the data generating process. So that's why, you know, tools like, let's say, Lasso or something like this are not going to be applicable here. And the second thing is that there is a high chance that even those models, which are likely to give the same fit, uh, they individually may not have parameters which are point identified. So, for example, you know, there could be kind of factors with collinear exposure, or there could be some factors which potentially are part of the model, but there is just uh, no way to identify the risk premium given that particular set of test assets. Yeah. So that's why there is lack of identification basically on double dimension in the model space and within, you know, those most likely uh, models. And um, indeed, you can think of it as essentially repackaging of some of those kind of older factors that are related to the factor structure. The important thing is that that factor structure is not only in the time series sense, but that factor structure in the cross-sectional sense as well, because we're talking about priced, you know, factors. And uh, you can think of it as a little bit of a generalization of also Luella, Nagel and Shankin, you know, sort of point of the implied factor structure in returns, just kind of formally tested in the whole universe of models. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Matteo uh, Bagnara has a question. 
Um, so basically, my question was just about the fact that um, when you have this slide where you show um, the um, the model probability, we're arguing indeed that um, the data are informative. And um, I was just wondering if that could be the case because we um, you're using um, portfolios that have a strong factor structure like destruction. And so in that case, when you um, end up uh, with the, the best performing model among the, all the, the ones that you have, um, I was wondering if you have some sort of um, results in performance to price the individual um, stock returns. Um, so I think there are kind of two parts here. Um, but in general, the dependence on potential choice of the test assets, again, is an issue that, you know, we've been really trying to think more carefully about. Unfortunately, so far, there is just no, you know, sort of best solution here. So any suggestions are very much appreciated. Um, what we have done is that we have estimated the model on like 26 different cross sections on, you know, different portfolios. Some of them are reported in the papers, others not reported in the paper. Also, when we're working on the revision on all the other test assets that have very different factor structure. And the results that we see on this dimensionality of the model space, they're exactly the same, okay? The second part of your question relates to whether it's feasible to estimate this type of models on the individual returns. Estimating the models on the individual stocks, I think, is going to require quite a lot of the change in the machinery for different reasons. For once, is that we have to deal with unbalanced panel. We have to deal with the time varying exposure of the individual securities and likely that the time varying exposure needs to be um, instrumented by characteristics of those stocks. So like all of those things, they should definitely be part of the model. It's not just we have, you know, a large panel of, you know, betas and lambdas and we just stick individual securities instead of the portfolios. No, the data generating process needs to be very carefully modified. And once you go into the level of individual stocks, you also have to think about missing data. So, for example, you know, missing characteristics. If you take, um, you know, recent papers as a, at face value, let's say, you know, uh, Kozik, Nagel and Santosh, we are talking about information potentially contained in like 40 different characteristics. And for all of that data set, on average, only 30% of the stocks at any given point of time actually going to have observation for all of them in the first place. So what, what I want to say is that to carefully do this type of analysis at the space of the individual securities, you have to solve a lot of the underlying problems that are often kind of not considered that carefully, but actually they could have a very large, very large impact on your findings. And this is why also going to, you know, large panel of the portfolios, it's not enough probably to just stack, you know, 300 portfolios together and just say that there is approximate factor model inside. I think we should really start from the underlying process of individual stocks. How to go from stocks to portfolios, model this sorting step explicitly, because then we understand what should be the right factor model uh, that we're going to be estimating like afterwards. Yeah, so I think uh, that is probably going to be a, um, a good way to go. And that's something that, again, we've been, you know, really thinking about. Uh, but so far, we don't have uh, the solution that we would be really kind of compatible with, you know, given the, all these complications and all the features that we think are really important to consider first. Yeah. So that's the challenge. Thank you. So we have uh, one last question from Alexander. Maybe Alex can type the question in the chat, and while he's doing that, I can also answer the question about the code. So we're happy to share all the code. We haven't really published it on the website yet, because the paper is obviously going through, you know, major sort of revision stages. But we are happy to share um, any code with you that might be of interest, whether it is related to estimating of a standalone model or whether it is related to, you know, more general sort of function of sampling and things like this. So please send us an email and uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to help in any way. Well, I'd like to thank, we'd like to thank uh, uh, Zetlana and uh, Irina for a very inspiring uh, talk and discussion. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, next seminar will be held on Tuesday, April 6th. Uh, Saditar Sundarasan from Imperial we we'll present a paper entitled More Risk, More Information, How Passive Ownership Can Improve Information Efficiency. And that's joined with Jan Tao Huang and uh, Christian Fidel. So thank you very much again for, for this great uh, seminar. Thank you.